What's up guys? Welcome to another video. It's currently 4 in the afternoon. I've only just woken up and why? Yes, I get it. I'm kind of notorious for having a crazy sleep schedule anyway, but because I was raiding all night last night, I really wanted to come to you guys with a video of some uh, details, some talk about the first kill, the first boss of the new wing, Slothazor. However, I haven't managed to beat him. We went at him for over uh, around 9 to 10 hours. Uh, still actually didn't secure a kill. But still had a lot of fun and kind of got to that place where we realize we understand the encounter. We understand that we've got a good comp. We know we can probably do it. It's just everyone's fatigued as all hell. How about we all go to sleep for the night finally, wake up and do it. So hoping to slaughter the damn guy this morning. But I didn't want to talk to you guys anyway because not only did the new raid wing come out, there was kind of just a regular patch to boot with it. Not something that I've experienced too much of. And yes, it's mostly gem store things. However, there are some interesting things from the world of data mining too. So I did want to jump into it at least just a little. So, uh, number one, first of all, I will say the raid was a little bit bugged when it first came out. I don't know how this kind of thing can happen, but when we loaded in after the patch came out, uh, as soon as five people got into the new wing, the next five people couldn't join them. Yeah, as in, it basically thought it was a dungeon, not a raid, and we had no way of getting through. We ended up actually getting a dev in our squad to help fix the issue and then push us through. I don't know how that can happen, especially considering, you know, they've done a lot of testing, obviously. Funny enough, in the patch notes, they expressed a lot of guilds. Basically, all the front runners, or most of the front runners in the raiding community anyway, had a hand, it would seem, in feedback for this wing, and I guess that technically disqualifies them from a world first. It's kind of, to me, one of these arbitrary things that I care less and less about. And as more wings come out, I think we're going to care less and less about as well. This whole idea of who cleared it first. It's not like there are any actual in-game systems to support it. It's not like people get titles. It's not like it's broadcast to everyone out there. At the end of the day, raiding is still a very new thing in the game. And I think people only really care because it's something they're used to from games like World of Warcraft. And it doesn't have too much meaning, especially when you see such a huge list of guild names out there and especially when you hear so many rumors just before the patch comes out about the fact that basically every big guild out there already knows what the hell's going on because everyone's got to play it early great well in any case i won't uh, linger on the raid too much longer for you guys just wanted to explain my uh experiences with it and uh there won't be any spoilers on it um, for a little while on the channel. I'm just going to talk about each boss, basically, first of all. Then we're going to do our big juicy lore summary. And uh, my goodness, it's a good one based on the names of some of the loot that you can get in there. Namely, the weapons, which back in Guild Wars 1 were known as oppressor weapons. Should be a bit of a hint for some of you guys. All right, so uh, so what else changed? Let's talk about the gem store, I suppose. Number one, a new glider, obviously. I usually don't like talking about the gem store stuff. I don't really care about it that much. However, I do think there is some discussion to have here based on this whole glider thing. I remember speculating back when they added core terrier gliding that a big motivator for this is that when you have gliding everywhere, all of a sudden gliding kind of becomes like Guild Wars 2's mounts in a weird way you know like mounts are one of those features they've never really done and it's become this thing that they don't do and so they find other systems that kind of help them move around that well boom they've got gliding now and the speculation was that with gliding everywhere they can sell them on the gem store and people will freak out it makes me smile to look back at the original release of the white wings from oh so long ago and then they did the black wings and they were the biggest sellers and it still seems that the gliders they're currently putting in the game sell really 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 well you can look at that with a lot of cynicism and think oh for god's sake I that you can look at it with sadness like I do that none of these are actually in-game content none of these are in-game rewards and it's not oh there's a little patch and there's a new little boss we added in one of the expansion maps just an extra little thing to do and if you beat him you unlock a new glider no 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 obviously this is all about squeezing money out of people and getting cash from the gem store you can look at it that way but also maybe it is a good thing that even in the face of such overwhelming negativity in a general level from a lot of the community at the moment People disappointed by the scope, the length, the quality of Heart of Thorns. Uh, people disappointed by the continuing updates that have gone in since Heart of Thorns released. The huge weight we've got from Living World. There's a lot of negativity around right now. And yet, 
ArenaNet can still say to their investors and CSOFT, hey, check it out, guys, we're still earning a crap ton of money, and we don't have to be worried, for example, that the next expansion's suddenly going to get its budget cut or anything like that. So maybe you can take that happy attitude. Uh, I'll let you guys decide which one of those you want. But it is crazy, the amount of gliders we've had. And this one is kind of a new one, old fashioned -y style glider. I doubt I'll be buying it, but there should be an image on the screen for you guys who are interested. In addition, as well, there is the classic before gliders existed to come save the gem sword day. There are the black. Black Lion weapons. So there's a new set of Black Lion weapon skins, the Dominator weapon skin set. This is kind of funny. I, I guess there are some people out there who a new raid wing comes out and they're going to see that there's all these really cool new weapons and gear and skins in the raid wing. But at the same time, they can't raid. But hey, don't worry, dude. You can just, you know, use your credit card to get uh, uh, another weapon skin, the Dominator weapon. So you can kind of pick and choose. The whole Black Lion skin weapon thing is so old to me now. For a while, I would check every single time quite excitedly what the new Black Lion weapon set looked like. And now there are several sets out there that I just don't even remember their names or what they look like. Um, you know, for a long time, I could tell you guys exactly the order of all the Black Lion weapon skins that came out, and they were significant, and they were something that you would put to memory. But now, you know, for the past six, seven months, it's just been a, a grab bag for me. I really don't remember most of them. Uh, more interesting as well, finally, on the Gemstall side stuff, is new hair colours. Uh, again, we have spicy new hair colours, and as someone pointed out on Reddit, how is beige a spicy colour? But whatever. Uh, we got caramel, we got champagne, country blonde, golden brown, mahogany, mocha, rich butterscotch, and rich chocolate. I'm not sure whether that really made me want to uh, pump up one of my characters and check out some new hairstyles as much as it just made me hungry. Probably my favourite update to have gone through here is related to an old item, is related to the wizard's hat. Uh, now, the wizard hat has always been a cool thing that I've worn on various characters. As you, as you guys know, one of the main looks I have for my elementalist when she's like on a Healy set uses the witch's hat, at the very least, a uh, slight difference. But the wizard's hat could never be dyed, and now it can. And you could make these uh, really cool looking cosplays and characters of various different um, mages that have been in other franchises and so on. You guys should see me on my char with a, a nice red hat running around right now. That kind of thing is really random, it seems. It's like, wait, why would you just suddenly make a single one of these items? Diable, but it does make it suddenly a way more interesting item, and you might just see a couple more of my characters using it. Another big quality of life change is I've always been a Captain's Airship Pass user, alright? So, for those totally new to the game, you've got two gem sort items that um, when you double click them in your inventory, they're permanent items, you double click them and they take you to a special place in the world where every service imaginable, sans the Mystic Forge, I think? are available right at your feet. Uh, so every type of crafting table, oh, I suppose Sans scribing as well now since Heart of Thorns, but every type of crafting table, a bank, a TP, anything you could possibly want, okay? And there are two variants of this item. One of them takes you to an exclusive place in Divinity's Reach that everybody loves to love. There are also portals to various places in the world as well. Or there's the Airship Pass. I'm an airship pass person, I like airships, and what's cool now is they've removed the invisible boundaries around the airship to allow you to glide off of it. Funny enough, I did a video on this exact idea when gliding came to Corteria, and I, I mentioned this, but it was basically wrong because there had been invisible barriers there, which have now been removed. So that's great, and uh, that's a little bit of a perk. It suspiciously coincides with the sail on the airship pass now as well. Hmm, I wonder, I wonder why that might be. Okay, so uh, there were a couple of other changes as well, raiding related, but nothing to do with the new wing, that I guess I will talk about just before we talk about uh, my favourite thing of this whole day, basically, which were data mining things. Um, but so there were some changes. Now, the devs kind of cagely and weirdly said on some of the recent streams, oh yeah, there are some other quality of life changes with the raids. I just can't think of them right now. I just can't think of them right now. What were those? Well, another chapter in the story of the adrenal mushrooms in raids and what is probably the final chapter of this little narrative. So adrenal mushrooms were added just before bosses at player request and because it just seemed smart, right? So you could try a boss. If you wipe against it, you can grab the mushroom, everyone's cooldowns are reset, you go in. It's a cool little perk for people who have the mastery. Great idea. They put it in the game, but then necromancers specifically start getting an awful lot of use out of this by summoning tons of jagged horrors. So the devs nerf the enemies near the entrance to the bosses so that they can't pop their mark, but that's only, I guess, a temporary fix. Doesn't really work very well. Uh, necromancers find a work around it anyway because of a champion nearby. So what do they do now? Now, the adrenal mushrooms are gone again. 
So we lose this kind of cool interaction with the mastery. The mastery suddenly feels a little bit less rewarding. But we now have an airtight situation. What the devs have done is they've treated the whole thing like adventures. So you go in, if you wipe against the boss, every player on your team, when they hit return to checkpoint, you all teleport back to the start of the encounter. And all of your cooldowns instantly refresh on their own. No picking up a mushroom. Mushrooms don't exist. No, there's no abuse anymore. That's just the way it works. And really... That is the plainest. That is the best way. I guess they just needed a bit of time for the coding, and uh, and that's basically been sorted now. They changed the achievements. Raids are a little bit more rewarding even further still now. I honestly do believe raids are thoroughly rewarding. Obviously, I'm not incredibly rewarded for my huge slog against Slothazor last night, aside from, you know, just the feeling of personal satisfaction getting better at the encounter. But once I actually am really good at the wing and I can clear the content very quickly, the raid will become very, very rewarding. Just play for a little while each week and get amazing ascended gear, basically, each time, and a chance for even pricier stuff beyond that. Really cool skins, but the devs push the rewards even further. The achievements that you get in Wing 1, Wing 2, and beyond, supposedly, now... Uh, they actually offer you an additional box, a box of raider supplies. And what do we get in a box of raider supplies? Well, you get ascended mats. You get, uh, as well as ascended mats, uh, a box that allows you to choose any exotic insignia or inscription, I suppose, that you like. And that includes the new ones. If you really think about the new systems that are in the game that allow you to stat swap ascended gear, what this means, especially for the new stats, is you can make any old generic uh, gear or get some generic ascended gear as a drop. And then use that exact uh, exotic item that you got there uh, of Wanderers without actually having to grind in the appropriate map in the Mystic Forge and voila then you've got some of the new stats. That's the way I got Vipers originally by the way and uh, that's pretty cool to, to see that they've now done that. So if you are playing the game, if you've already cleared Wing 1, just go back into the Spirit Veil for a second and you get a bunch of rewards. You can also now from the vendors buy the Ascended Jewelry that were rarely dropping before. I have no idea why ArenaNet didn't put those to the vendor loot list before. So this is a very basic concept guys in the raid. Uh, really cool exciting stuff drops from bosses but you also get a currency magnetite shards and if you don't get that lucky drop for that thing you've been looking for for long enough your magnetite shards will have grown to a large amount and then you can just straight up buy it from a vendor so it's kind of a, a check to stop people with horrendous rng from never getting the item that they really want uh, that's a great idea arena net did it but then they also in wing one added a bunch of ascended gear in the way of amulets and rings and so forth stat selectable ones with the new stats this being the only way to get ascended stats for some of those slots of the new stat types uh, Then they they put those in the raid wing and never put it onto the the vendor So they really were like that classic raiding experience of oh just grind and grind and grind until you get lucky I got lucky enough to get one back piece and that's it um, Throughout my entire time of playing and I know a lot of people who I've been playing with haven't got one ever so those being on the list is quite nice now and I think that will make um, certain builds easier to get now for people who are, who are actively raiding anyway uh, and then lastly there's this whole mini thing so this was something they talked about a lot excess minis currently if I do kill the Veil Guardian the first time and I get the Veil Guardian mini pet cool then I get the Veil Guardian mini pet a second time and I'm like oh that's a bit annoying then I get it a third time then I get it a fourth time and I'm just thinking for God's sake these are four items that not only didn't I want but are taken up like my chance of getting something else that's really cool I hate this all right uh, well so now if that happens you can at least sell those to this same vendor and get more magnetite shards 40 of them and those magnetite shards actually go beyond the weekly cap so there's a weekly cap of the amount of magnetite shards you can get and uh, you can go over that by selling these minis which is kind of a fun idea when you think about the fact that now especially because you can also salvage gear from the raid now to get magnetite shards too now in theory you can get infinite magnetite shards in a single week by just doing the raid and raid and raid and raid and raid, and raid. every time you get a lucky drop you sell it and get more and more and more which is kind of a crazy thought. Who's going to set up the bots? The 10-man bot party, guys, to clear the raid. Go for it. I'm looking forward. All right. Uh, and so finally, just uh, to talk a little bit about data mining towards the end of the video. That shaman, of course, did uh, have a little bit of a look at the patch. Mostly, it's just information that's currently live in there. But I did want to pick out the sigils. So, first of all, a disclaimer, this is data mining, we don't know whether these sigils are going to end up in the game, but these are really cool. Now, half of me says they're really cool because they're just overpowered, or at least one of them is ridiculously overpowered, as it would seem. The other half of me says that they're really cool because they are particularly flavorful. So, sigils in this game have never really been that good. 
in my opinion. Not at launch, not even through many of the live updates they did. I mean, if you look at the state of sigils at launch, it was just awful. Two-handed weapons only getting a single sigil. Sigils of completely different types, sharing cooldowns with one another, and one could only ever proc. Some of them absolutely blatantly far more overpowered than the vast majority of the rest. Sigils were just terrible. Um, and slowly over living work, over the game's development, they have really improved the system by an incredible amount and they're really starting to look quite good but the sigils themselves still haven't been that fun some of them are quite rng heavy even a lot of the new ones that they're adding just they don't seem to have enough flavor to them to make them as fun as they could be as you see in some other games right like the main thing i always, when it comes to rune and sigil discussion a lot of people always cite games like diablo to me right like and i can see what they mean there so uh what we actually have here if they end up in the game are some really interesting sigils first of all the superior sigil of whirling deflection the description of this is that it will create a whirlwind that reflects projectiles when you execute a whirl finisher we know that they have the technology to do something like this. Think about one of the new warrior skills where it creates that very brief reflection frame. Think about uh, even a deflecting shot on the Guardian. I know that they can actually do this. This is capable in the engine. And this would be really exciting on so many levels. Number one, it adds a lot of reflect potential and skill-based clutch twitch reflect based stuff to a lot more classes out there without it being completely over the top and you know diluting class boundaries of what classes are supposed to be distinctly good at but also and here's the really important thing that makes this super cool is it puts emphasis and strength on well finishers well finishers have always just felt really lackluster and kind of poopy the most i ever hear about people even considering well finishers are on necromancer builds where they'll say oh you should drop your corrosive poison cloud and then whirl in it with your four so you get extra poison or you should do that on your uh, fear wall to get some confusion ticks out there but honestly the well finishers have never counted for that much and I'm really excited to see this sigil go in the game and then everyone's looking at their class again and thinking damn actually this well finisher this well finisher if this sigil doesn't have an ICD okay an internal cooldown which it probably does you can con start considering things like tornado which just has a permanent well finisher on you and this would be a way of augmenting your tornado as an elementalist to be a, a reflect as well which may actually give it the quality of life it needs to be a bit more sticky and useful in say conquest which would be kind of cool I don't know obviously I'm an Ellie main so I, I threw up an elementalist example but there are tons of well finishers out there tons and to think that we might be reflecting during them that's very exciting the other one I think we can absolutely categorically say has an internal cooldown on it, though it is not listed on the data mining. This is the superior sigil of explosive vortex. And the description here is particularly crazy. Pull nearby enemies towards you when executing a blast finisher. Feels incredibly engineer. Feels uh, like it would have, you know, like a 20 second ICD on some or something like that. The thing that's cool about this though, with a lot of sigils that have high internal cooldowns, often you're scared to use them because those can accidentally proc and you want them in very specific times. The funny thing about this though, is especially when you look at like a PvP context, you can much better control when you do that blast knowing that you have that pull, right? Even if it has like quite a long ICD on it, you might be okay actually quite controllably using this exactly when you want it. The strength of this is absolutely dependent on the numbers they give it, all right? It depends on the range of the pull and it depends on uh, how low of an internal cooldown it gets. Obviously, we don't have that information right now. So what's more important to focus on is the flavor of it. And uh, I, I very, very much agree with it, just as I agreed with the pre previous one, the superior sigil of whirling deflection. I'm looking forward to these going in the game. I do believe there'll be a sweet spot for the both of them. And uh, let's hope that they actually do. And aside from that, guys, uh, without going into spoiler territory, I think that's pretty much everything I want to talk about for today. So that's the latest patch. Do keep an eye. Uh, I, by the end of the day, I should have actually beaten Slothazor, and I'll, I'm hoping to get the next video out talking about him. There'll be a bit of raid coverage, of course, going on, but there's very little else anyway. Hope you guys enjoy. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Looking forward to learning a bit more about the Forsaken Thicket with you coming up. Have a great evening, everyone. I'll see you next time. actually serves the narrative.
in the most of the game, because the game's designed to be pretty easy, it's very hard to make the player feel intimidated or scared or genuinely hateful towards something or really feel like they care about killing an Elder Dragon or something, because most of it's just a cakewalk. But in the raids, big, scary, threatening, mysterious, uh, potentially dangerous monsters actually are big, dangerous, scary monsters. And you get that double up, right? Like, you try so hard to...